Hi everyone, welcome to Chemistry 1315 Lab, 1316 Lab, 2310 Lab, or 2311 Lab. My name is Professor Moore. I'm going to be teaching you Chemistry Lab this semester, and this is the first lecture or the first bit of content that will be on your exam. This is Chemistry Laboratory Safety. So how we should work in the laboratory to reduce the risk of getting hurt or causing somebody else to get hurt in the laboratory. This content will be on your first skills assessment, um, so make sure that you're taking good notes, be sure that you're following along on your own PowerPoint, and be sure that you've taken the chemistry laboratory safety quiz after you've watched this so that you can get a good idea of the kind of questions that I'll be asking on the exam. So student safety responsibility means that students should be working safely to reduce the risk of themselves getting hurt and their laboratory partner getting hurt. When we work safely, we reduce the risk of everybody around us getting hurt in addition to ourselves getting hurt. This semester, we will not have laboratory partners. And the reason why we will not have laboratory partners is because it reduces the spread of COVID-19 in the lab. So you will be working alone on your own experiments. However, there will be somebody across the table working from you um, on their own experiments. And so make sure that you're working safely so that the person across the table from you will not get hurt. OSHA's HASCOM standard or right to know standard is a law that requires universities to tell students the harmful chemicals that we have in the laboratory that can hurt them and how to prevent them from getting hurt by those chemicals. And so to fulfill this standard, we'll talk about safety data sheets. We'll talk about how to label our chemicals when we're using them. And you'll be getting training today on how to handle chemicals, toxic substances, um, the procedures that we use in the lab, and how to read safety data sheets. The Environmental Protection Agency is very important, important in our chemistry lab, and the reason why is because the EPA tells us how to dispose of hazardous waste. The EPA has given us certain guidelines that we have to follow when we get rid of our chemicals, and the reason why is because if you're working with something that's very dangerous, such as lead or mercury, and you put it down the drain, it could potentially come in contact with somebody else, um, and that could be particularly dangerous especially to people like children and pregnant women. So we always dispose of our chemicals the appropriate way. I will always tell you how to dispose of your chemicals. You may have to make some decisions on your exams to make sure that you're reading your PowerPoints and keeping up with lectures. Um, however, in class, you'll never be asked to make a decision by yourself on how to dispose of something. Anytime you have a question, please feel free to ask me. So some general lab rules, um, you should never enter the laboratory without a professor in there, even if the door is open. So if you see the door open, you can peep in. If you don't see a professor, you should shut the door and wait. Um, the acceptable people to be in the classroom with you are myself, Professor Moore, um, Dr. Lanier, and Dr. Gautreaux. No eating, drinking, smoking, or chewing gum in the lab because the chemicals that we use are hazardous. We don't bring or store food or drinks in the lab. We do have a lab refrigerator. However, it's for chemicals and not regular food stuff. And so you should never bring food or drinks in the lab because they can become soiled with chemicals. No pranks or horseplay in the lab so that nobody gets hurt. And of course, if you're unsure of any time of what you're doing, you should ask your instructor. So the way that we define hazardous chemicals is any solid liquid gases or synthesized product that presents a health hazard when used. Um, in the chemistry laboratory, since we are an academic lab and you guys are still learning, we classify everything as hazardous waste just to make sure that nothing is accidentally brought home with you um, or that you don't accidentally come in contact with something that actually is hazardous. Um, and so that includes everything including the tap water. I mean, the reason why is because water, H2O, does have a chemical structure, and so it is treated as a chemical. We do not drink the tap water that comes out of the laboratory. Um, it should be regarded as hazardous. Some hazard identifiers on the chemical bottle. Sometimes you'll have the NFPA fire diamond. Sometimes you won't. Pictograms are these things right here which we'll talk about in just a moment. Sometimes you'll see a hazard word on there which says danger or corrosive or flammable, and we'll get to hazard words in just a moment. And located in the laboratory, we do have our safety data sheets. 
So this is that NFPA fire diamond that was on the previous page. It's a diamond and there are colors on this diamond to tell you what the hazards are. And so this may be a one, this may be a three, and this may be a zero. Each number on here indicates the level of hazard. The bigger the number, the more hazardous the chemical is. And so you will typically have to label this on your exams. Blue would be health, red would be fire, yellow would be reactivity, and white would be any kind of specific hazard um, that's odd for the chemical. So if you have to wear a respirator in the lab, which is a situation that we wouldn't typically do, that would be denoted there sometimes. Um, so any type of specific hazard. These are the acceptable hazard pictograms that we can use in the lab. Some of you may be used to seeing the old orange versions. Those have been phased out. We no longer use those in science. We use these nine pictograms as of 2012. Um, so make sure that you understand these, you understand what they mean because you probably will be asked to label them on the exam. So these are the definitions of some of those hazard words that we were speaking about earlier that might be on a chemical bottle. So flammable means something that's set on fire. Corrosive typically means that there's irreversible burn damage to a person's skin or an object. An irritant means that it just causes inflammation or other discomfort, um, not something that's particularly harmful, but it can cause irritation. Low hazard uh, means that there's not it's not no hazard, but that it, it presents no significant hazards. Toxic means poisonous. Um, explosive means that it can be made to violently burst apart. So that little exploding bomb on the previous page. Environmental hazard means that it threatens the surrounding natural environments. That includes animals and aquatic health in addition to humans. And an oxidizer is a chemical that can undergo a reaction and chemically combine with oxygen to do different things that you'd like it to do. Safety data sheets are commonly abbreviated as SDSs. They're prepared by chemical manufacturers um, to OSHA's HASCOM standards that we previously spoke about. Um, it indicates the hazard and safe handling information for a chemical. So what that means is the hazards that a chemical can pose to a person by using it and how you should safely handle a chemical while you're using it. We do keep safety data sheets for all of our chemicals in the laboratory in a yellow binder, which is in the chemical storage room in Classroom 107. Um, I will show you guys where everything is at in the laboratory when we go in for Experiment 1 so that you're familiar with where all of the things are. PPE, personal protective equipment, is going to be the things that we wear on ourselves to prevent ourselves from getting hurt. Chemical splash goggles are um, the typical big laboratory goggles that you would put on to prevent splashes when you're working with chemicals. Um, safety glasses are not allowed in the lab because they don't adequately prevent against splashes and spills. So you do need to have a pair of safety goggles. Um, you're responsible for getting those yourselves. We cannot provide those this semester because of potential cross-contamination amongst people with COVID-19. Um, but you can get them very cheaply from somewhere like Home Depot or Lowe's for less than $5 usually. Protective clothing is going to be the things that we wear on ourselves, like our lab coats or our scrub top, our pants, um, shirts. And so specifically for the protective clothing, protective clothing that we require in the lab is button lab coats during the active experimentation. Um, however, you can substitute a button scrub jacket as long as the scrub jacket covers your wrists and buttons completely up. I know a lot of you guys um, are pre-med and you have jobs in the medical field. And so your scrub tops that button are fine. Long bottoms that cover the ankles when in a standing and working position. Again, for those of you who are in the medical field and are coming from work, your scrub bottoms are fine. They do typically cover your ankles. Um, a pair of blue jeans are typically fine. Any kind of pants that are loose fitting and cover the ankles when in a standing and working position. Things that are specifically not allowed are shorts, short skirts, capris, dresses, and leggings. Um, specifically because leggings are very tight fitting um, and leggings typically cut off above the ankles. I usually go calf high or knee high and that's not protective enough. 
Um, your clothing should fit the body appropriately because tight spills will not prevent against skin contact in the event of a splash or spill. If you spill acid on yourself and you're wearing tight workout leggings, when you go to take that off, it may rip your skin off with it. And so you want to make sure that the clothes you're wearing are loose fitting and they can be removed easily if you become soiled with chemicals. You guys are responsible for obtaining your own clothes. Um, the university won't buy your clothes for you, so make sure that you have those clothes prior to coming in for experiment one. Footwear and gloves, you're responsible for obtaining your footwear, and the university does give you your gloves to use while you're in class. So the specific type of footwear is going to be closed toe, closed back shoes, and so typically people would wear tennis shoes um, or like work boots is what I typically see guys wear. Um, perforated shoes like Crocs with the holes in them, sandals, heels, and ballet flats that expose a large portion of the foot like teaks are not allowed in the lab. If your flats cover your entire foot, then you're more than welcome to wear them. Um, students are required to wear gloves when handling chemicals, so during experimentation. The lab does give you nitrile gloves to work with. Um, most people do not have nitrile allergies. However, if you do have a nitrile allergy, I can order you latex gloves. Just make sure that you get me that information as soon as possible so I can put that order in for you. Face shields and face coverings are not typically something that we would wear in an academic lab. However, because of COVID-19 this semester, everybody is required to wear a face covering. And so you can either choose to wear a mask, and so a face mask such as a cloth mask, a surgical mask, an N95 mask, those are all acceptable. Or you can wear a face shield, a plastic face shield. And so I've purchased a plastic face shield for everybody in the class. We already have them in the office. I will be giving them to you next class period. Um, everybody has one and you can wear that in place of a mask because it'll be a little bit easier to breathe and work with. Um, however, I can't replace that mask if you lose it. So make sure that you do keep up with it. Hair and hygiene, we just want to make sure that our long hair is confined. We don't want to dip our hair into chemicals on accident or catch our hair on fire. Um, and make sure that you're not using flammable hairspray or flammable gel before coming to class, just in case we work with flammable chemicals that day. Lab safety equipment is the equipment inside of the laboratory that we do use in the unfortunate event that a laboratory accident or an emergency happens. CHP, this will not be on your exam, so you can X this out um, for studying purposes. I do have to tell you that we have it in the lab, and so I've told you that we have it in the lab. What's pertaining to you guys is the Student Laboratory Safety Manual. It's been posted in Moodle. I'd like you guys to read through it, um, not taking notes and not memorizing anything that's in there specifically. Um, however, the fire plan is in there, the evacuation plan. If you're not familiar with the lab and you've not been to you before, take a moment to look at that kind of stuff. That way you know um, where you should be exiting and where our emergency um, evacuation rooms are, where we go to in the event of an emergency. Um, make sure that you have signed the commitment to lab safety form in Moodle by next class period. Don't bring it into class. This semester, I won't be physically collecting anything from you because of COVID-19 purposes. Um, however, you will have to click the I agree button in Moodle um, prior to next class period. And if you don't agree, then you need to come speak with me um, and we need to talk a little bit about lab safety. The safety shower is a device that we use whenever somebody becomes completely soiled with chemicals um, and a sink is not going to be sufficient enough to get chemicals off of them. So when using a safety shower, first and foremost, somebody in the classroom should decide if calling 911 is necessary because sometimes people can get very hurt by chemicals and we want them on the way as soon as possible. Walk swiftly to the shower, do not run. Turn on the shower, which you would pull down the little triangle handle. I'll demonstrate that to you guys in the first class period. Remove all of your soiled clothing. Don't worry about anybody else in the classroom. The door does close to the supply room, so you'll be fine in there. Um, and make sure that you're under that shower for 15 to 30 minutes after your clothes are all taken off. And then you should always follow up with your personal physician in a situation like that just to make sure that everything is okay. 
Eyewash stations are kind of like safety showers for whenever we get chemicals in our eyes instead of on our bodies. We should not be getting chemicals in our eyes because we should be using our safety goggles, our laboratory goggles, not safety glasses. However, if it does happen as you're packing up, if somebody else is working, for example, first thing you should do is take off your glasses um, if you wear them or contact lenses immediately. We do recommend you guys not wear contact lenses in the lab because if you're working with something that's exothermic, so for example, it emits heat, it can weld to your eyeball and you may have to have surgery. So we don't recommend that you wear contacts in the lab. We recommend you wear glasses, so you should remove your glasses. Somebody should contact 911 if necessary. You should walk or help the person get to the eye wash station swiftly, never run. Um, the person should hold their eyelids forcibly open after they've turned on the pedal to the safety uh, eye wash station. You should rinse your eyes for 15 to 30 minutes, and then you should always follow up with your personal physician because you only get two eyes in your entire life and you want to make sure that they are healthy and that they are good after you get chemicals in them. Fire extinguishers, we have two of them. They're located in classroom 107 and 108. We never use fire extinguishers on another person. We use fire blankets only on humans. Fire extinguishers are to be used on contained fires only. When the classroom is on fire and it's a big fire, we evacuate. We never use an extinguisher on that. And so the steps to using a fire extinguisher, and you may have heard this before, pass, pull the safety pin from the handle, aim the hose at the base of the fire, never at the top, at the base, squeeze the handle slowly and discharge the agent. Um, it's going to be very powdery in most situations. Um, and then you sweep from side to side to extinguish the fire. I have had to extinguish laboratory fires in specifically organic chemistry before. It's not unheard of. However, it's very rare. So please make sure that you are working safely and that you're not causing fires in the lab. A fire blanket, this is what we put on humans whenever humans catch on fire. So we do have a fire blanket in the lab at the front of the classroom in 107 only, not in 108. Um, to open a fire blanket, you should pull it down, open the blanket. It is full of fiberglass, so be prepared for the fiberglass when you open it. You'll probably have to go home and at least change your clothes because you'll be itching if you don't, all day long. Um, for an object on fire, you would put a blanket on top of the contained fire, and that would cut it off. The oxygen would be gone. Um, and for a person on fire, you would wrap the blanket around the individual that's on fire after they are laying down, and that's very, very important. If you wrap a fire blanket around somebody that's on fire while they're standing up, the fire is going to go up and onto their torso, onto their face, into their hair, and that's going to cause a lot of pain, a lot of scarring, and it could actually kill them. So we want to make sure that they have stopped and dropped. You place the fire blanket on top of them and then have the person roll. First aid kits are first aid stations. Um, we have one that is located on the wall by the fire extinguisher in the supply room. Um, we also have another small one in the supply room above the eye wash station. Students should never go into the first aid kit without first telling an instructor. The instructor in the class should always be the judge of whether something is truly a small incident or whether it needs to go to the emergency room to get seen. If you shove glass through your hand, that's not something that we would let you use a first aid kit for. You'd need to go to the emergency room. However, if you've just got a small cut from a piece of glass, that would be something that we would allow you to put a Band-Aid on and follow up with your physician as needed. Small fires are fires that are contained to one little workbench. It can include humans. Um, the way we put out small fires is with a bigger piece of glassware. So you'd put a big piece of glassware on top of it and cut the oxygen off. And that'd be the end of it. A fire blanket, if it's something bigger on one particular desk, or a fire extinguisher, if it is something that a fire blanket is too small to handle. For large fires, um, those are fires that have engulfed a pretty substantial portion of the classroom or multiple workbenches. We never ever attempt to extinguish a large fire. We evacuate the building immediately because no life in that building is worth trying to put out a fire in the laboratory for if it's a massive fire. So what we do is leave our belongings behind and we evacuate to the biological learning and research building across the street which is directly between BRPT Lake and the LSU building. 
You should not leave campus until a senior representative of the university, um, such as the chair of our department, which is Dr. Gotro currently, the dean of arts and sciences, which is Dr. Rash, or somebody in administration like Brother Ed or Dr. Holland has told you it's safe to leave after you've been accounted for. For small chemical spills, you should notify your instructor and your surrounding peers if the instructor is near, but definitely the surrounding peers, that way they don't accidentally stick their hands in it. Um, Determine the appropriate way to clean it up. Again, if you're unsure, ask your instructor. I'd be more than willing to help you clean up any kind of chemical spill, and then you just clean up the spill accordingly, and that's it. For large chemical spills, you always notify the instructor and your surrounding peers, um, because if it's big, we don't want anyone walking through it, putting their belongings in it, slipping and falling in it. Um, if the spill is unknown, or if it's potentially dangerous, so it can explode, it's emitting toxic vapors, it's organic and it's cancerous. Um, we would alert everybody present in the classroom. We would evacuate to the BLURB. The BLURB is the acronym that we use for the Biological Learning and Research Building. Again, leave your belongings behind, especially if they're soiled. Do not ever bring a soiled chemicals belongings with you. Um, and again, don't leave campus until you've been instructed by someone of the university. And then you always contact 911 if necessary. Um, in that situation, 911 would always be necessary. Acid and base chemical spills are based on something called the pH scale. For those of you in general chemistry, you may have never heard of the pH scale. Those of you in organic chemistry should know the pH scale. We spend more time talking about this in 1316 and 1316 lab. So the pH scale is a scale that basically looks like this. In the middle, you have seven. On one side, you have one, and on the opposite side, you have 14, and it ends at 14. You can't have a negative pH, so it stops at one. It doesn't go to zero. At zero, that would mean the chemical does not exist. So on one side, you have acid. It burns. On the second side, you have neutral. So like water, for example, is relatively neutral. It may be a little basic or a little acidic, but it's pretty neutral. And on the 14, you have a base side, which also burns. A lot of people think that bases don't burn, but they do. They burn very badly. Um, an example of a base that's not harmful is going to be soap. And so whenever you spill an acid, something on the one side, you would neutralize it or bring it to the 7 position by doing the opposite to it, by putting something that has a 14 on it. So you neutralize an acid with a base, and it evens out to be 7. When you spill a base, you do the opposite. You put an acid on it, and it neutralizes out to be seven. So when we clean something in the lab, we always want it to be neutral. We don't ever want it to be acidic or basic before we clean it up and put it in the waste bins or in the garbage if it goes in the garbage or down the drain if it goes down the drain. Um, if the spill is very large, so it covers a substantial part of a table or it goes all over the floor, always notify your instructor. If it's greater than 5 molar, so that M means molar, M-O-L-A-R, that is the unit that we use to measure concentration in the laboratory. If it's greater than 5 M or 5 molar, you always notify your instructor because at that point it's becoming pretty concentrated and it can burn you. Combining acid and water. We never pour water into acid, and the reason why is because it's a violent exothermic reaction, especially when we have concentrated acid and water. Um, it's kind of like a pseudo explosion, and so whenever something is hot, the molecules are moving around a lot, and they can project upward and onto the student or the person that is mixing the acid and water. And so the way that I remember this is the little phrase, acid into water, you're doing what you ought to, water into acid, you're going to get blasted. And so this is very important to remember as you're working in the lab to make sure that you don't accidentally cause an uh, exothermic reaction to happen. Um, because it does get hot, sometimes it can get hot enough to burn you, um, but the biggest risk is that it's going to project upward and onto you. Just some general rules for chemical safety. Always mix chemicals under a fume hood when instructed to do so. We'll speak about fume hoods in a moment. Don't run with chemicals. You should never be running at any point in the laboratory, whether you have chemicals or not. We don't eat, drink, or directly smell chemicals. We always use a wafting motion when you're, inspect and when you're instructed to smell a chemical. We don't mix chemicals that we don't have permission to mix, and we don't attempt unauthorized experiments. That can be a very dangerous situation. 
Um, we never, ever, ever mix strong oxidizers with volatile organics. This is going to be very important for those of you in organic lab and for those of you who are in 1315 lab working alongside people in organic. And the reason why is because it can cause a very violent explosion. Very, very dangerous situation. No mouth pipetting. We always use pipette bulbs or pipettes. Um, if you know what mouth pipetting is, then you shouldn't be doing it. If you don't know what mouth pipetting is, then don't worry about it. We'll always use pipettes. And again, if you're unsure of what you're doing at any time, please ask your instructor. I'll be happy to help you. For chemical storage, we never store our chemicals inappropriately. And what that means is that we never store our chemicals in a place that is not approved by our instructors. Um, instructors will typically tell you where to store your chemicals or your products if you need to save them for the next class period. That place will never be in the fume hood on a small balance or on an analytical balance because it can potentially ruin the equipment. Your stuff could potentially be thrown away by a TA who is cleaning or by myself or by another instructor. Um, your chemicals that are stored must always be labeled with your name, the date, your class, and your section. So for example, the class and section would be like 2310lab-2. So make sure that you know your class and your section number. Um, and common names for chemicals are acceptable. So um, for water, you wouldn't have to put dihydrogen monoxide. You could just put water on the label. That's fine. And if you're unsure of where to store your chemicals, be sure that you ask your instructor. For our personal belongings, our book sacks, our book bags, our purses, we typically store them at the front of the classroom. However, this semester, um, to prevent people from crossing one another when it's unnecessary to keep us all six feet apart, to keep us from coming in contact with anybody else's belongings, we're going to store them directly underneath our workbench, packed tightly underneath the workbench. Make sure that they're not loosely packed under there, um, that they're all over the place because if they become soiled, they do have to be thrown away as solid waste. Chemical safety and devices. The only thing you should have on you this semester on your bench is a calculator. Um, you shouldn't have your phones. You shouldn't have your laptops. You shouldn't have your iPads. I do typically allow them. However, um, having you store them during class will prevent potential um, cross-contamination with COVID-19. It'll prevent you from bringing that home to your family and of course to yourself. So the only thing you should have on your bench this semester that's electronic is gonna be your calculator. Um, and if I do catch you with your electronics, you'll typically get a warning after that. You may be asked to leave and go see the chair before you can come back to class. Fume hoods. Um, so we have two fume hoods in the classroom, one in the front of the classroom, one in the back of the classroom in 107. In 108, we do not have fume hoods, so you'll need to be working in 107 if you need a fume hood. Um, we should keep the fume hoods clean and clear. We shouldn't use them as storage, and you have to wear appropriate PPE when you're working in a fume hood. And so the purpose of a fume hood is to pull fumes away from you while you're working with hazardous chemicals so that you don't breathe them. Um, you do need your PPE because just because you're working in a fume hood and the fumes are being pulled away from you doesn't make the chemical any less hazardous than what it actually is. To operate a fume hood, it's very simple. You just turn the button on on the outside of the fume hood. You place a Chemtech wipe or a piece of paper underneath the fume hood for a few seconds to make sure that it's operating. You'll see it moving. You'll see it waving like it's trying to go away from you. That means it's on. Um, they're very loud, so it's hard to mistake whenever a fume hood is not on versus when it is on. When we're working in the fume hood, we don't work with the sash all the way up, which is the thing that moves up and down. Um, we keep the sash lowered. We work four to six inches inside of the fume hood when we're moving and when we're working in the fume hood. Um, and we should keep it clean at all times. If you spill something, tell your instructor and clean it up. Um, if you don't know how to clean it up, ask your instructor. Hot plates are kind of like electronic ovens. Uh, the purpose of a hot plate is to heat up a reaction, um, typically to speed it up as a catalyst. You should never place your hands on a hot plate to check the temperature. You should use the temperature knob or a thermometer to test your product's temperature or the temperature on the hot plate. You should never put your glassware on top of a hot plate when working with volatile organics. And this is specifically for organic chemistry. So for those of you in 1315 or 1316, you will be using um, glassware directly on top of it. If you're moving into organic, you will not be using direct uh, glassware directly on top of it. You'll have to use a sand bath for heat transfer. 
because it's a volatile organic chemical typically. Do not place paper or plastic near a hot plate in use. It can melt or catch fire, um, and that would be bad. And also, you should not attempt to speed up a reaction by adjusting the hot plate's temperature. Um, your instructor has written your labs in the safest way possible for you to achieve the outcome that you're trying to achieve, so make sure that you respect that and you don't adjust the procedure by changing the hot plate's temperature unnecessarily. Hot plates are also very easy to use. You just turn the button um, after you've plugged the hot plate into whatever temperature you'd like it to be. Um, you, check the, you check the temperature by looking at the knob or by using a thermometer in your product. When you're finished, you unplug it and you leave it there. The hot plate typically will not be cool enough for you to put it up at the end of class period. What usually happens is we leave our hot plates out on the bench and several hours later, either myself or a TA will come in and put them away for you. Um, so you should never, ever attempt to store a hot plate unless it is completely cooled down, safe to touch, um, never, never goes up while it's hot. The way we classify our waste in the lab is organic waste, metal waste, solid waste, and glass or sharps. So for organic waste, it's chemical waste containing three or more carbon atoms in its structure. Um, metal waste is waste that contains metals as defined by the periodic table. So something like, again, lead or mercury that can't go down the drain. Solid waste is either soiled solids on our desks, such as pipettes or paper towels or our personal belongings, such as our binders, our lab notebooks, and chemical solids. Um, and glass, our sharps, our broken glass, needles, past our pipettes, capillary tubes, melting point tubes, etc., etc. I will always tell you when something needs to go in the glass waste um, versus being cleaned in the sink. Things like past our pipettes, capillary tubes, and melting point tubes, we do not reuse. Those go in the sharps container after a one-time use. We always dispose of our chemical waste appropriately. We talked about that on the EPA slide. Um, our chemical waste in glass is usually excess solids and liquids after we've completed an experiment. Um, and chemical waste is always to be disposed of correctly. If you don't know how to dispose of it, please let me know and I will help you decide how to do that. If you break glass, it's very, very important to stop what you are doing. Do not move. Put your hand up and say, I've broken glass and I need help. I don't want you stepping in it. I don't want you hurting yourself. I don't want anyone at the table to get hurt. Um, so just stop and say, I've broken glass, and I will come right over and help you. That broken glass will be put in the sharps container if you come across a piece of it after we've cleaned up. Um, if it's not pierced your skin, we just clean it up as normal. If it has pierced your skin, you notify me, and we'll either have you use the first aid kit or if it's had chemicals on it or in it, you'll have to go to the emergency room and get evaluated. Um, and if it's a big enough cut, like it goes in somebody's throat or something, we would call 911. As for reporting safety incidences, I don't want you guys to ever feel like you cannot report a safety incident to me. It's very important that you report a safety incident. You'll never be in trouble for it. Sometimes I do have to file a report with the university. However, that is not a disciplinary report. It's just a report saying that something happened. Those of you who have jobs in places like daycares or healthcare industry um, or education know that when something happens, you have to file an incident report. It is what it is. So don't be afraid to tell me that you've had a laboratory safety incident. Um, the biggest priority is making sure that you're okay and you're taken care of. Um, and again, this is not disciplinary in nature at all. So never feel bad for reporting a safety incident or reporting a safety incident that you've seen somebody else experience because they can be hurt very badly, even to the point of death sometimes if there's allergies or large cuts. And the very last slide for behavior, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. We need to behave uh, professionally in the lab. The purpose of this lecture and the purpose of this course is to prepare you um, to be a professional scientist, to prepare you how to behave professionally in the lab and to do things that are expected in the lab. Um, so in life, you know, we have social norms. In the laboratory, we also have our source social norms. And so it is my job to teach you what those norms are. Um, and so we want to try to behave professional. We want to try to follow the rules. Um, and there are consequences that you can read over yourself in the syllabus whenever behavior standards are not met. And that's it. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, you guys know how to reach me. My email is daphne.moore at franu.edu.
I do answer usually on the same day, unless it's a very busy time of the semester, like midterms or finals. I do typically answer the next day during that period of time. My number is also in Moodle. It accepts phone calls and text. Sometimes the fastest way to get a hold of me is text when I'm in the laboratory. Um, and so that's it. Let me know if you guys have any questions and have a good day.